eyes move left and right and up and down, okay, your eyes also rotate like that. It's really cool, but it's really tough to see on your own. So turn to the person next to you, right? And just one of you, pick what you want, right? Tilt your head slightly to the right and then slightly to the left. If you feel comfortable, all right, why would you open that? Okay, and see how your eyeball stays vertical. Yeah? I think that's fascinating. Tell me you've got it. Good. You can't see anything? Is the person you're looking at human? All right. That must be everything. <laughs> Go! Where's my keyboard? Doesn't matter. We'll get there when we get there. All right. Okay, and back to me. Let's go, 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 surely. Sorry about that. I like to start my lectures on time. I apologize for the delay. I work hard to try and get everything set up by the time you get here, and I apologize. <sighs> so this is what the room looks like. I gotta say I'm disappointed. Like week one when we covered no material of any import at all, ah, the room was pretty much full. Week two when we reviewed some stuff from physics, ah, the room was two thirds full. Hopefully, this is like where the room sits. So about half full, I would say less than half full. And there are 374 students in this class, I think. And this room holds 350. So um, if you are sitting at the back because you like sitting at the back, you're welcome to do so. I like the intimacy of a little bit more eye contact. Um, I'm sh uh, slightly short-sighted. Um, so you look like black. That's okay. Um, but that's okay, I can see your eyes. See the whites of your eyes. Let's, let's do this. This is the first lecture where I think you will be introduced to probably unique material for you. So I'm gonna tell you things that uh, you might have never heard before and won't be in your normal experience. I recommend if you're taking notes, don't write down what I say. There's a joke that goes around, engineering lecturer says good morning class, Engineers say? No. Anyway, the joke goes that engineers say good morning, Phil. That, that backfired. In medicine, the medical lecturer says good morning, class, and the medical students write down, good morning, good morning, class, right? See? Thanks for helping with the joke. I feel like we were partners in that, and it worked. On the recording, you can't hear you guys anyway, so for the recording's perspective, everyone say good morning. Um, so don't write down what I say. I would recommend write down the things that I say that are surprising to you. Right? Things that I say that you disagree with, right? or you haven't heard before. You really disagree with me, that's fine. Um, when I lectured this last year, I lectured it, and particularly concept 32 and 34, um, I lectured it once, and then we came back and I lectured it again, because I just got lots of feedback. Hey, we didn't know what you were talking about. So. <sighs> I th anyway, we kind of nailed it second time round. So I've incorporated some of the second time round stuff into the first time round stuff. We'll try and nail it, but I think it's better if it's conversation, if it's dialogue. Um, it, sh it should be surprising. I, um, I think it's unintuitive, and that's part of the problem with thermodynamics, is you don't have much physical experience. And talk about why do we care about pure substances anyway? To give me confidence with my lecture this morning, my mother-in-law is staying with us at the moment. Um, to give us confidence in, uh, in the lecture this morning, I asked my mother-in-law, what's the boiling temperature of water? Because I, oh, well, I'm gonna ask the class and you know. She said, oh, I think I used to know, but I'm not that sure anymore. <sighs> okay, good, it's fine. 
Nevertheless, we're engineers. Um, what's the boiling temperature of water? It depends, is the right answer. I was expecting 100 degrees from my mother-in-law. It depends is the right answer. Uh, was I disappointed when she said she didn't know? Um, I have more experience with my mother-in-law than is appropriate to share, so I wasn't surprised. No, no, no. Right? I've been married to a daughter for six years. Um, I wasn't surprised. Cool. It depends. We'll talk about why it depends, what it depends on. Alrighty. Wow. Cool. Stories. All right. I'm not going to tell any of those stories. So, when we talked about ideal gases, we said, what's an ideal gas? We said there's some assumptions that we, that we use. Uh, we say that the particles don't have any interaction with one another except to bounce perfectly elastically off each other, uh, the molecules in the ideal gas. And we said so there's no attraction. And we said the volume filled by the atoms or molecules is very small with respect to the overall volume filled by the fluid. Okay. Um, and so we said, well, atmospheric air is an ideal gas. You know, you've got very small particles floating around in a large volume. Um, and we said, well, it breaks down close to saturation temperatures and pressures. So therefore, we'll define pure substances as a substance that's close to or at its saturation temperatures and pressures. Saturation means a change of phase. So we're talking about going from a gas to a liquid in this case. Um, we'd call that, we're talking about um, that being a point of saturation. When we say, for example, oxygen is an ideal gas, that's true for us in our normal uh, treatment of oxygen, but it's not true if you work at a cryogenic plant. Okay? Uh, cryogenics, you're taking oxygen and you're compressing it, possibly to a liquid form. You no longer treat oxygen as an ideal gas. Oxygen is now, for you, a pure substance, because you have to take into consideration the sorts of crazy stuff that happens at uh, low temperatures and high pressures. All right? We consider water a lot, A, because it's very important from an engineering standpoint, and B, because it, you have some experience with water. Um, so examples of pure substances, water. I'll talk a lot about water today. We'll talk about refrigerants later. But refrigerants, and I've listed two of them here, there is a naming guide published by the IIFIIR. It's like the International Institute for naming refrigerants. So they're fun guys you want to invite to your party. Um, but that says what the numbers are. You can reconstruct the molecular, what the molecule looks like from the R number. And that document would tell you how to do that. Um, we won't really go into that. Um, we'll just use the refrigerant and the refrigerant data as it stands. Um, so, this is, this is liquid, this is water at, uh, at atmospheric pressure, okay? So let's do a thought experiment at one atmosphere and let's take water from something cold and we know it's liquid, all right? 20 degrees, we're gonna add heat in the form of a very powerful candle. Um, and we're going to go from 20 degrees C to 100 degrees C, okay? And through this transition, all right, the water is rising in temperature and it's slightly increasing its volume. Water gets slightly less dense as you go from four degrees C up to 100 degrees C, but it's still water, okay? Then we're gonna keep adding heat and like my kettle on the, on the floor, okay, the water is still at 100 degrees C, but we start to boil off some steam and this steam is also at 100 degrees C. Okay, so you've got two phase. So th this would be called the point of saturation. Saturation. Okay. This would be called a mixture. This would be called a compressed liquid. Compressed liquid. Or a supercooled liquid. Right? It's in a super cooled state, but we often say compressed liquid because um, it's not very cold, 20 degrees, so you can, it can be a confusing term. Right? We heat it to the point of saturation, 
We heat it until it boils, and now it's a, a mixture of um, gas, vapor, and liquid. And then we heat it all the way until another point of saturation. And this point of saturation is where it's all vapor. I think they've used the colors wrong. I think this should be gray. But Sengel and Bowles wrote the textbook. So, you know, they probably did some thinking about it. Um, so this is the point where it's all vapor, but it's still at 100 degrees C. So this is the absolute point where if a little bit of heat is removed, uh, some liquid water will fall out of solution. If a little bit of heat is added, you'll go into a superheated state. And indeed, we've continued to add heat. And this is called a superheated vapor now. OK? Vapor. The word vapor and gas can be used interchangeably. We often use vapor when we're dealing with pure substances um, so that we don't get confused with ideal gases and water in its gaseous state. And so in this case, it's one, pressure is one atmosphere. It's at 300 degrees C. All of the water exists in the vapor form. And it's not just about to condense out. So if we looked at that on a TV chart, so temperature and specific volume, That's a map we'll hope to get there. Cooler. Good, good. So where do we start? We started at 20 degrees C. The density of water is around about? Around about 1,000. So the reciprocal of density being specific volume is around about 1 thousandth. So my chart just happens to be appropriately axis is appropriate. Now, when we increase the, so we're adding heat. Right? So we're going to start at this state point, okay, down here. Um, we're going to add heat, and it's going to slightly expand. So the specific volume is going to slightly increase. The density is going to slightly decrease. Probably not even that much. Until it gets to 100 degrees. Right? And then it's going to expand. And indeed, so this is logarithmic on the, on the x-axis. It expands all the way up to about 2. It expands a lot, um, and that's important too. And then, so this is our point of saturation again, okay? Our points of saturation. And then as you add more heat, the temperature rises, so we're no longer constrained to be 100 degrees. The temperature rises, and it also expands, continues to expand, and does something like that. On a logarithmic chart, it's a bit hard to, hard to get right. What would happen, so, that's, so we'll draw that. This is an isobaric process at uh, 100 kPa. What would happen if the temperature wasn't 100 kPa, but was instead 1 megapascal? If you take liquid water at 20 degrees C from 1 atmosphere to 10 atmospheres, yep, right, so we've, we've increased the pressure by tenfold. Um, oh, it compresses, oh, sorry? Does it shift it up? You're getting good. You're getting close. It compresses just, uh, just a tiny bit, but not very much. All right? It follows a pretty similar line, just a little bit to the left. But a fascinating thing happens when it gets to 100 degrees. And that is nothing at all. Liquid water at, so we're drawing a 1 megapascal line here. Liquid water at 1 megapascal continues up to about 180, about 180 degrees, and then it starts to boil. And it has a boiling line that goes like that. Okay? And then, because it's so highly compressed, it's not quite as big when it's all boiled, and then it goes like that. OK? Is anyone surprised by that? Did anyone know that? Who, yep, good. All right. There's an interesting um, video. It's too long for me to post. It's like nine minutes long. But it's guys who boil water at various points as they climb Mount Everest. And you get the opposite effect. So at base camp, boil, water boils at 80 degrees C. Right? And that's related to atmospheric pressure as it changes. Now, you could imagine that then at 10 megapascals, 
let's draw a 10 megapascal line. All right. At 10 megapascals, you get a very similar point there. It follows a very similar line up here. Let me refer to my textbook. I've forgotten. Cool, no worries. And then, at 310 degrees, nominally, the water starts to boil. Boil, 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 boil. All the water's boiled, saturated mixture between those two points, and then it goes up, and that's your 10 megapascal line, MPA. Sorry for my writing. Kellerman, when he writes on these notepads, is like, you could publish what he writes by hand. Me, I'm like, ah, whatever. Draw. Um, so, there's a couple of things you might think of when you look at this chart. And one of them is that if you, instead of going in large increments, so here I've done um, one order of magnitude each time, if you went in very small increments, you might get, let's draw it in red. Draw in red. You might get, you'd get a point there, right? Well, we know these points. You get a point there, you get a point there. But if you then checked 120 kilopascals, 140 kilopascals, right, you might get a line that kind of goes up like this. Okay? And on the boiling side, you might get a line that kind of goes, I'll draw it as a line, like this. In fact, those lines intersect and what kind of chart has 374 written on the chart? That's just weird. And in fact, they look like that. I'm going I'm to cut across to a more professionally drawn version of this. <clears throat> uh, but I wanted, to see, I wanted you to see how it's developed. Um, we'll talk about why pressure influences the boiling temperature of water as we go on. I'm going to tell it to you like a number of times in a number of different ways in the hope that it becomes intuitive intuitive for you, okay? But this line here would be the line of saturated vapour. <coughs> vapour. This line here would be the line of saturated rated liquid. Okay, because to the left-hand side of that line, it's all liquid. To the right-hand side of that line, it's all vapour. This would be the zone of mixture where some of the uh, substance is a vapour and some of the substance is a liquid. All right. We'll talk about that point there. And there's a line down here we'll talk about as well. Excellent. Are there any questions, thoughts, concerns, comments? Go. Why does it shorten? Why does it shorten? Yeah, yeah no worries. Yep, I agree. So this, so why does it shorten? So the question is, the length of this line gets shorter as the temperature gets higher, right? Because this is temperature, okay? And the reason is the length of that line is the difference between the density, if you like. It's specific volume, but I'll use density because we're, we're more familiar with it. It's the density of the liquid water when it boils and the density of the vapour when it starts to get superheated. And the reason for that is, if you could imagine lots and lots of pressure, okay, it's pushing the particles closer together, and so therefore, even as a vapour, it has a higher density. Okay? And this direction is higher density. Higher density. Okay? And so vapour at 10 megapascals, as it approaches all being vapour, is pushed together, and so it's there. The alternative would be at like five kilopascals. So I'm talking absolute pressures here, not gauge pressures. So we're talking 95% of the evacuated vacuum. Right? You could imagine that water vapour actually is quite rarefied. It's not very dense at all at the point that it becomes vapour. So yes, that line shortens, and it has implications for us. Um, the length of that line is representation of the energy required to boil the substance as well. Um, so that becomes important. Good question. And also? Oh, no, no. Let, let Lad behind you talk because he rarely talks. Um, why are you starting at 0 0.0001 from whatever the element 0.001? Oh. 
because I'm not good with logarithmic charts. What? 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 Did I mention we were going to go to a professionally drawn chart? <laughs> it's a good question, thank you. And your question was the same thing? No. Good question. What happens above the graph? Rodeo. So at a temperature of about 374, 374.14 uh, from memory, um, you get to what's called supercritical. This point here is called the critical point, which I will denote CP, critical. Let's talk about atmospheric air. At atmospheric air at atmospheric temperature, all right, you can't compress atmospheric air enough to make it a liquid at atmospheric temperature, right? So there is a temperature above which, okay, and for water it's 374.15, there's a temperature above which no matter how dense you make it, okay, so going to the left here for higher density, no matter how dense you make it, you'll, those molecules have too much energy to bond as a liquid, okay? So above this temperature is called supercritical, and it's a temperature at which, at no matter what density, you'll, know, you'll never get liquid water condensing out of, your, um, out of your substance. So, in fact, the compressed liquid region is below that line, and the vapour region is this region inclusive of the space above here. Um, it's a good question. That's the answer. Good, excellent. Are there any other questions? Thoughts? I love it. I really like dialogue. Chris? What happens to the right of the chart? To the right of the chart? No worries. You, so, yes, you're right. It's logarithmic. So, out here, okay, in this space out, space out here, you need to be really low pressure to get there. So, if, uh, if we did a 5 kilopascal line, I feel like I should do a 10 kilopascal line because that would be um, an order of magnitude below our 100 kPa. If you did 10 kilopascals, it would look like that. It would go there. And then it would go like that. And that would be 10 kPa. Okay. To, get, to start to get into this region here, so you've got really low density at really low temperatures, um, you need quite an extreme vacuum. Right? And I guess there's some, well, is there some sort of limit? No. Yeah, so you just get really rarefied air at low temperatures. That's why, so that's low density, low temperature. It's a good question. Um, excellent. Let's keep going. Oh. Look at that scribble. Sorry, was there another question? I'm, sh I'm slightly short sighted, I apologize. Yep. Yes. That's a good question. Um, no worries. So your skin's a porous membrane, which is going to limit... Sorry, the question was, uh, astronaut is exposed to a vacuum. Um, why doesn't the water boil off? The answer is it would start to boil off. Um, but there's a couple of things working for you in your body. One is, for water to boil, it needs nucleation sites. So you can... Um, there's a good video by Veritasium. They're all good. All the videos by Veritasium are good. There's a good video by Veritasium uh, on why aren't trees limited to 10 meters in height? Because if water gets up a tree by vacuum, um, water should boil at 10 meters. We'll talk about that. Um, so how do trees get more than 10 meters in height? And the answer is uh, you can vacuum water beyond that as long as you don't have any sharp bits where the water can commence to boil. So I'd suggest that inside your body, uh, you probably don't have that. So there's not a lot of nucleation sites. Water would get to your skin and immediately evaporate and you'd get cold. I'd suggest hypothermia rather than um, your insides boiling would be your concern there. And the other thing is the energy required to boil water is quite high. I'd suggest he wasn't in the vacuum very long. So I'd suggest the water is boiling, here's getting cold. I've put a link up on um, boiling water till it freezes. Hopefully you saw that. Um, so I'd suggest you would get cold 
and they'd get him out quick smart. I don't know, but if you find uh, the paper on it or a YouTube link describing the video, you know, video, we like videos, um, they're simple. If you find that, can you post it on Microsoft Teams to let us know? Now's when you're ahead. Let, let me know and I'll address it because um, I think it's a fascinating question. I will come to you in just one moment. If you're not on the Microsoft Teams platform, we're going to send through a request to IT to give you Teams access. So if you're in the class and you enrolled late, we might not have enrolled you, um, email me today. Kellen's going to put through a push to IT. We'll get you on Teams. Go. Yeah, with that last question. Yes. The, um, like, pain from boiling. Yes. That's not coming from the boiling data board. That's the energy in the water, right? Yes. So as water boils, it makes the thing that it's touching cold. Yeah. So it's taking energy from your skin, and that would be, so you'd feel, I suggest cold rather than vacuum necessarily. Yeah, it's a fascinating thought. Not strictly of an engineering relevance, although, you know, that's more a thing. Yes, go. Where did you post the video of water boiling to a screen? On Microsoft Teams, on one of the channels. I don't know. Are you on Teams? Good, excellent, check it out. No, no, well, you can't establish a complete vacuum if you've still got liquid water. Um, oh, oh, so much thermodynamics we should learn. I'm loving it. All right, good. I really like dialogue. Just, uh, you know, the idea of me talking for two hours does not excite me. Um, strange profession. All right. This is, this is a chart drawn by someone else using a computer. So I would suggest that the, uh, <clears throat> everything's a bit better. Oh look, he starts at 0 0.01. That's just, you know, he, he knows how to divide by 1,000. Um, so it's the sort of thing that we've, we've talked about, right? I just want to point out a few things, okay? So um, subcooled or compressed liquid, liquid. Subcooled meaning if you add a little bit more heat, it's not just about to boil. And that is the region, okay, off here to the left. So anything there would be called subcooled, right? Saturated liquid and indeed the saturated liquid line is so labeled here, saturated liquid line, okay, is the line describing when a subcooled liquid becomes saturated so it's just about, if you add any more heat, it's just about to boil off some vapor, okay? Quality region is in the middle here. Uh, we can call that a, a region of mixture. We can call it the quality region because if you look at the length of this line, okay, so from that point to that point, and you have some point along that line, let's arbitrarily choose a point that obscures 100 kPa, if you divide that number, so this is length, right? Length in millimetres, if you're reading a chart. If you divide this number, let's call it A by B, X equals A divided by B, right? Then X, and X is the letter that's used, all right? I'm not making this up. X is the letter that's used. We will define X as the quality of the mixture, okay? So if A was almost the same as B, then the number would be about one. If A was really, really, really short, then the number would be about zero. Okay, so X is bounded by the numbers zero and one. Uh, we'll talk about quality soon. But uh, where the substance is along that line is quality X, and we use it as an intermediate variable um, for some of our calculations. Cool. Superheated vapor. Right, is this superheat region up there? Um, sorry, my apologies. That says saturated, saturated vapor line, saturated vapor line, superheated vapor. The region over there. Um, we talked about the lines, and we mentioned critical point as well. The critical point is so labelled on this graph up the top. It's the te it's the temperature at which any higher temperature can not be compressed into a liquid at all. Um, excellent. Just a more formalized uh, version of that. Want to 
tell you stuff a couple of times. Um, if we did something different, if we took water at 100 degrees C, okay, so this is isothermal, and we compressed it from 50 kPa, so it starts as rarefied, so it's all superheated vapour. Notice that the word superheated means it's all vapour. 100 degrees C, you're like, that doesn't sound superheated. No, it's a, it's a defined word that means it's, it's all vapour. Right? If we lower this piston to such a point that the vapour is now at 101.3, or atmospheric pressure, at 100 degrees, so now it's saturated. All right? Okay, question, it came up in the forums. What, so to have an isothermal process, okay, so it's 100 degrees C, what needs to happen to heat? If we say... That's the first law for closed systems, this is a closed system. All right. What's happened with Q to get from 50 kPa to, a, to one atmosphere, 101.325 kilopascals? Anyone else? Yes, go. Uh, we haven't had any phase change. It's a, good, it's a good thought because heat is converted during phase change, but in this case we've gone from vapour to vapour, so there's no phase change. It's a good question. Oh, it's a good, it's a good um, thought. Go, Chris. Loss to the surroundings. Okay, so we've done negative work to the system. So this is a negative number, okay? And so Q must also be a negative number. So we've lost heat to the surroundings. Now, it's not an ideal gas, so we can't use um, Q equals MC P delta T. Um, so we can't use that formula in this case, but it is worth knowing that oh, we're losing <laughs> Heat to the surroundings. Excellent, good. Let's keep compressing the, um, the saturated, uh, saturated vapour down to a mixture. And you see a mixture involves saturated vapour at the top, saturated liquid at the bottom. They naturally condense out because of gravity, so the vapour is much less dense. Um, and then we get to some point. Notice here the temperature is the same and the pressure is the same. The pressure is the same. And then at some point we compress the liquid to 5 bar. Um, that is very deceptive. That height would not reduce by that much under 5 bar. That, that you wouldn't see the compression at this resolution. Um, but at some point then you get into the compressed liquid state. Okay, so if you did that a number of times at different temperatures now, you would get a PV chart. So the other one was a TV chart. This is a PV chart for water, H2O, and these are lines of constant temperature. So 60 degrees, 100 degrees, feels like 100 degrees should be about 0.1 megapascal, that feels about right, um, 200 degrees and so forth, and 374 is so marked. At higher temperatures, you can't get water to compress into a liquid, so that's what we said. Um, saturated liquid line, saturated vapor line, just a different way of representing the same information. Um, Remembering our state postulate, that, yeah, go. Yeah. I love it. If Don't apologize. Have a, a of water, yep. Yeah. Yep, H2O. And the gas was higher than the temperature. Whoop. Whoop. Could you compress it such that, like, the gas got denser than the liquid and you could get it? Are they the same substance or are they different substances? Different substances? Right, yeah. So we will only consider pure substances. Let's see what you talk about. So what you're saying is if you had a substance, so you've got a mixture, you've got a substance at the top, which is supercritical in temperature, right? And then you've got a substance at the bottom, which is not supercritical, and you compress them, compress them, compress them. Can the vapour become denser than the liquid? I reckon it's tough, because vapour by its very nature, that molecules are further apart, you'd need something dense. 
you need a heavy molecule. Let me think about it. And, oh, sorry, and the, sorry, the question was, can you get it more denser? And so therefore, you have the liquid at the top and you have the gas down the bottom. So yes, that would happen just by virtue of density. But I'm trying to think of a, of a liquid, what's a light liquid that's not supercritical. I think heavier molecules have higher critical points in general than lighter molecules. And so I think that's working against you as well. No, if you compress it, the liquid will have a tendency to not boil. The liquid will boil if you lift the piston up and reduce the pressure. Now the liquid's going to boil. If you compress a liquid, it tends to stay as a compressed liquid. Yep. Yeah, and if they're different substances, that's um, a little bit more complicated. But it's a good question, though. We're thinking about um, density, we're thinking about temperature, thinking about pressure. Good, love it. Was going so man what we need is like an equation of state right because last week was so simple um pv equals mrt is there an equation that is just so framed for water h2o because we'll use that as a type of all substances it exists and i invite you to read that paper i couldn't get past the preamble that is by the it's the, it's, the, uh, it's the International Institute on the Properties of Water and Steam, I think. <laughs> they invite actuaries to their parties to liven things up. No. <laughs> That's a joke, right? Anyway, um, so there is, and it's got about 60 terms in it, right? So it's not, it's not PV equals something, all right? It's phi equals the summation from 1 to 30, of, anyway, you can open up, have a look. So for our purposes, we won't use the equation of state. If you're programming this in a computer, you would potentially use um, that institute's definition um, of the equation of state. So what do we use in the absence of an equation of state? Um, well, as engineers, we look up property tables. And it's wonderful, it's great. It's, mu it's far better than, uh, than trying to solve it. Uh, this is table A6 in your textbook. Um, so I brought my textbook. The publisher gives me a textbook, so I feel like it's, you know, it's hard for me to say I encourage you to buy a textbook, except to say you're doing six months where I teach you how to use a textbook. The resource is uh, potentially valuable afterwards. Um, but that's okay, so this is table A6. You can see, so this is tabulated exactly what we've just seen on the charts. Okay, so I want to try and make that connection with you. Okay, this is temperatures running from 0 0.01 degrees C and a very low pressure. That is six, 61 pascals. 61 pascals. So we're talking about 100, 100 kilopascals, right? You're going out of the kilopascal range, down into the pascal range. That's 61 pascals. Um, through to, and the temperature will go all the way up to 374.15, um, and a pressure of about 22 megapascals in the table. Cool. So this temperature and pressure define, you know how when we did the compressed, uh, compressed liquid example, I said the temperature is staying at 100, the pressure is staying at 101.325, but the, the volume is changing and we're losing heat. Okay, so this is the temperature pressure couplings. So at 50 degrees and a pressure of 12.35 kilopascals, okay, you get that coupling. And then, you know, at uh, 200 degrees and a pressure of 1.55 megapascals, you get that coupling. So you get this environment where you're going to get a saturated mixture. And so the rest of the chart is then divided into what happens at the extreme liquid end of the line? So there's a, there's a line subtended across, right? So the extreme liquid end of the line has some properties. And then what happens at the extreme vapor end of the line? Okay, this is a table of properties for saturated water, saturated H2O. So this is just in that quality region underneath the graph. Okay, and then there's other tables for the other parts. But let's talk about saturated. 
Um, so this then defines what happens at the liquid end of the line. Liquid here is denoted F. Doesn't matter, it's how, it's how it's done. F, F, F. So this is respectively the specific volume, Vf, of liquid water at those temperature and pressure couplings. The U, which stands for... Good. I was hoping for like a chorus effect. Uh, specific internal energy, lowercase u. Lowercase h, which was a property we introduced Wednesday last week, which is specific enthalpy. And S, which is entropy, which we'll talk about later. Um, got a question on the forum about it. I'm like, let's not address that. Right here, so at the liquid end of the line, this is your density of water. Yeah? As the temperature rises. And you can see, so specific volume, uh, reciprocal of density, they haven't got it wrong. Um, you can see it's about one and one thousandth, okay? Um, and then, let's underline them. G stands for gas or vapour. And this is the properties of saturated water at the extreme vapour end of the line, okay? And so... This kind of relates to what we're talking about. The line is longer at the bottom of the chart and shorter at the top of the chart. Okay, you can see here that at 0 0.01 degrees, water goes from 0 0.001 meters cubed per kilogram to 206 meters cubed per kilogram. That's really far off to sorry. That's really far off to the right hand side of the graph. Um, at a more reasonable temperature, like 80 degrees, it goes from about the same density to about three meters cubed per kilogram. So it becomes more dense, comes in a little bit. So this is describing that curve. Um, the difference between the U values is the, in, is the energy that you have to put into the liquid to get it to boil at the given temperature. Right? So the difference between this value here and this value here is the kilojoules per kilogram of energy you need to put into liquid water to turn it from a saturated liquid at 15 degrees C to a saturated vapour at 15 degrees C. Right? So the difference between those, and because we use that difference so often, we've got two properties here, HFG and SFG. This is, if I make it square, that is the difference between those two values. So it's just, they've done the subtraction for you, and we'll find that to be really useful because otherwise that's a subtraction we do very often. And SFG, difference in entropy, again, so if you wanted to know what 8.01771 minus 0 0.7036 was, it is 7.3735. Subtraction done. I'm that good. That's a table. We're going to talk about tables a fair bit. I wanted to introduce it. I want you to be comfortable with it. Um, how you doing? I thought I'd tell a story. Has, there, has anyone got any questions about anything there? Good, tables. Table is exactly the same as a chart. We'll use the tables more because they're a bit easier to read than the charts. Ah, what's the boiling temperature of water? Right? It depends. You can get water to boil all the way from 0 0.01 C. You can't get water to boil below that. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well. And you can boil water all the way up to 374.14 degrees C. You can't get water boil above that temperature because it's already super critical. Um, the answer is it depends. Oh, go. Why do we care? Boiling water is a big deal for thermodynamics. Um, we've talked about power stations, steam power stations. We use a lot um, of it to generate electricity. Um, that heat that it takes to boil water, we exploit that quite often. And we talked about water, but we can use different refrigerants. We can select a chemical that has a different curve for a, a given purpose later on. Um, that's that. Let's tell a story. Sorry, 
Yep, no worries. Let's not tell the story. No, no, that's fine. Up, uh, up, up. What you'll find, if I freeze that, no, I want to freeze the other one. The question was, how does the table link up with the, with the charts exactly? And it's a good question. So let's freeze that. Dup, dup. Freeze. Ta-da. We should, we should look at a table drawn by someone else. Anyway, uh, have I got one? There. Here's a table drawn by someone else. All right. Okay, this is TS. So it's slightly different, right? So temperature on the vertical, I was going to introduce this to the later. Right, a lot of, lot of data. Right, temperature on the left, uh, on the vertical, entropy on the horizontal. Okay, let me zoom in. Let's find a point. That'll do. Have I got 100? I've got like, let's look at the 200 line. Good, good, okay, 200. I'll come back here so I can read. You can read the numbers on the right. Okay, excellent, good. So let's look at what happens at 200 degrees C and where it happens. Okay, let's come across the right hand side. So 200 degrees C at the saturated liquid line, the entropy is 2.3. And indeed, over here, if you follow the 200 degrees C on the vertical and come across until you hit that black line that says saturated liquid, okay, it's about there, right, about 2.4, 2.3. This is why we use charts, because they're way more precise. Um, right, so indeed we find that the water is boiling at 2.3, an entropy of 2.3, and indeed by the time it gets to 6.4, an entropy of 6.4, we would expect to all have boiled. We're tracking this line here. Whoop. 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 And indeed, 6.4 appears to be where it's boiled. And you're like, why are we looking at a TS chart? That's because we haven't really talked about entropy yet, so it's a little bit um, uh, esoteric for the moment. But what else can we see there, if I hadn't drawn a line over it? We can see indeed that at the boiling point, the enthalpy, right? These are lines of constant enthalpy H. Man, I'm drawing over everything. Right, lines of constant enthalpy H. The enthalpy should be between 800 and 1,000 kilojoules per kilogram. And indeed, here... Right? It becomes, it's 850, 852 at 200 degrees C is our enthalpy at the point of boiling. And indeed, when it's all boiled, it should be between 2600 and there'll be a line of constant enthalpy here as well. So it's going to be just above 2600. And indeed, it's 2793. So, with a really with a lot of time and a table, you could generate a chart. This one's TS because TS charts are really good to work with for steam power generation for reasons we'll talk about. But you could imagine, indeed, that you could make this a TV chart, right? And just the curve would look different. You'd put the numbers in different places because you're trapping specific volume. Uh, the reason this looks messy is these dotted lines are specific volume, okay? These solid green lines are enthalpy, I believe. Yep, that's an enthalpy curve there. These numbers are quality, 50%, 60%, 70%, 80% quality, all right? There's your quality marker. Uh, oops, yep, quality equals 10%. So it's trying to put everything on the same graph. And of course, these lines are entropy and these lines are temperature. Um, I want you to be able to read a chart. I think it would be reasonable for me to ask you an exam style question based on information presented as a chart or as a table. Um, and as engineers, you'll deal with a lot of that because we don't do much like long calculations. We just kind of um, let someone else do the calculations and we read it from a table. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, well, it's, but have a look at them. So they're both up on. Um, on one note, um, so have a look. Do you okay if I tell a story? <coughs> I am. Um, I quit my job in Western Sydney because uh, it was a toxic work environment and was unemployed. 
Uh, I'd been married for just a bit less than a year, and my wife married someone with a good salary. <coughs> Heaps awkward. Um, <clears throat> to then quit my job. So I had to find a job. So I applied for a job over in Western Australia at an alumina refinery. I'm not saying the word wrong. It, they make white powder. Alumina is aluminum oxide. It's the ceramic that, for example, is used as the insulator on his spark plug. Um, so this is a, a refinery. This is Google Maps. Uh, this is the refinery that I worked at. Um, Thank you, Google Maps. Just for perspective, like those are cars, yeah, and these are tanks. That's like a big tank. Okay, so it's a big place. Um, and I was responsible for all of the piping. This is all piping in racks. Oh, I need to change color. Let's go to something you can see. This is all piping in racks. So I was the piping. Uh, tanks and pressure vessels engineer. So I was responsible for these tanks, these tanks. Um, I might have oversold myself a little in interview, uh, but I got the job. So you oversell yourself in interview, work hard when you get there. Um, <clears throat> no one noticed. So, <laughs> no, it was fun. I'll tell you about another time where I um, <clears throat> oversold myself as, for my lecturing capabilities and ended up as a lecturer. <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, you've heard that one. No, so uh, the thermodynamically relevant parts of this story are this is a power generation site. Okay, so this is taking coal and it's burning it. Uh, it's creating steam, running steam through a turbine to generate power for the site. We generate about two thirds of our own power on site. And then the waste steam uh, we put as heat through pipes, right? Steam is very useful to transmit heat. We put out as heat and through piping, and I went up there, and I went across here, and then I went down here. So this is the steam piping. I think we heated these things over here. All right, cool, cool, cool. Excellent, so we did install, so there was that, and that was there when I, before I arrived. Uh, the year before I got there, they did an upgrade, so they went from four and a half million tons per annum to five and a half million tons per annum of alumina. Alumina is this white stuff. Um, that's where I ended up working. Um, so they installed a new bit of plant here for which they needed steam piping, right? They needed heat. But because of all the facilities being serviced by the steam pipe down here, if they just piped the steam directly into that, uh, they would have had too much pressure loss for the pipe. And so they said, well, as well as connecting it here, we'll also connect it around here. So put it in a steam main and they made a ring main of steam around this whole facility. So around these, the number of facilities there. Um, and shortly after I arrived, the pipe here uh, fell off its saddles. So this is like 600 mil, mm, yeah, 600 mil pipe. It's carrying steam at 1.2 megapascals. Um, and it had an event, so it sits on little stands. These are up in racks, okay? So it's, um, 12 meter, 18 meter, 24 meter high racks, and it jumped off, its ra uh, jumped off its mounts and landed on the rack and damaged some things in the process. Um, and so I'm the piping engineer. Hey, Phil, piping engineer, tell us what happened. Um, I just can't communicate the, the humor that I find in that, but that's okay. So we went, so we went to a meeting. Uh, it was, so I was a mechanical engineer. There was a process engineer, um, some operators and so forth. When you, when you pump steam around, in pipes, it's really useful because if you know the pressure, you know it's gonna be at or above a certain temperature unless it condenses into water. Ah, I pressed the power button. It's all right. Enjoy the view of the mountains. So what you do with steam is you don't run it in horizontal pipes, you run it in pipes with a horizontal fall of at least one in a thousand. For us, that was our, our standard internally. And then, obviously, you can't do that indefinitely. And then you have a rise, and then you drop it again. And all your liquid water collects at this point, and so you install a water trap, which is a floating device, not dissimilar to your toilet, the system in your toilet. And so when liquid water develops, it floats a valve up, the water goes out, recloses, and you've got good steam. So that's fine. So we found that the pipe was damaged here and also that um, the, the water trap was broken. 
there was a temperature sensor in the nearby area. Okay, tracking temperature against time, and it went. And then, about the time of the incident, unusually, it flatlined. Then the incident happened, and then it re-jumped up, and it was all good. And the prevailing thought from the operators and the process engineer, who should have known better, was that the thermocouple stopped working, either electrically or mechanically, um, and then it suddenly worked again, and we reckon that the explosion happened about there, um, or the event that, that caused this pipe to dismount. But I knew that the pipe was 1.2 megapascals, that the pressure in the pipe was 1.2 megapascals, and this temperature here looked suspiciously like 188 degrees C. And I literally took my textbook to this meeting and said, I think that we had liquid water in the pipe, right? And we know that it maintains its temperature as long as you've at least got some steam. Um, and what had happened, and, and that was then accepted. So the water trap was broken before the event, right? And then the, uh, we had liquid water develop in the pipe. What we had inadvertently done which I wasn't involved in this part, which is excellent, um, is we'd made, a, we'd made a ring main around the whole thing, okay? Just before the incident, we shut down these little guys here. Let me move to something green, right? We shut this facility down for maintenance just before the incident, which lowered the demand on this leg of the pipe. So it all teed out here. It lowered the demand on this leg of the pipe so we didn't get much steam flow. The steam trap, the water trap was broken. And so we got a whole pile of water. So this is a pipe, right? We got enough water here that it covered this with liquid water. Okay, so that's the, the water line. All right, blocked off the pipe, which was fine. And all of the, all the steam was being ca carried along that leg of the steam main, which was fine until they turned this facility back on. When they turned this facility back on, there was a massive re-demand of steam on the system, much more than could come through this uh, end of the leg. They re-got steam through here. This is 1.2 megapascals. I don't know if you can appreciate that kind of pressure. Right? All this liquid water was forced through, and the momentum of forcing that liquid water through the up leg um, was what caused this to dismount, it damaged some stuff in the meantime, the water trap uh, miraculously started working again when this pipe broke off. It spewed all liquid water onto the ground and then started spewing steam into the air. Um, that's one of those times where I've seen steam that's clear and then it gets, um, so that was kind of fun. Um, and so the, the moral to the story was um, about this thing which like I said, the process engineer, so that's a chemical engineer by, um, by uh, education, the process engineer should have known better than to think that the temperature gauge had broken and then refixed itself. But this idea of water boiling at a high temperature to higher pressure was what ended up um, defining the root cause. Didn't have anything, to, it didn't, the incident still happened. I wasn't that much of a hero. That was, um, that was my story, I wanna talk about the alumina refinery later, because I worked, later on I was responsible for this thing here, which cost a little over a billion dollars to, fit, uh, to build and underperformed, and so my responsibility was to get that working. Um, so we'll talk about that, there's some heat exchanges and stuff in there too. That's it. Um, do you want to, okay, take a break, good. <laughs> Let's come back when the big hand's pointing at the three um, and we'll talk more about steam tables. No, it's gonna be fun. Cheers, guys. Hey, I finally got a credit.